Este es un video de 30 minutos de duración dividido en tres partes de 10 minutos cada uno, donde un anciano superintendente de los testigos de Jehová en Salt Lake City, declara en la corte, tergiversando la verdad para proteger a la Word Tower by Bell and Tract Society de una demanda civil. En este video un anciano superintendente declara que expulsar es un problema congregacionalista y no un problema de familia y que los testigos de Jehová no utilizan la palabra rechazar. Él habla positivamente de la expulsión diciendo que por cada seis o diez personas que es citada para declarar en la corte de sus malas experiencias con su expulsión, él, a su vez, puede llevar a la corte a cien personas que han sido expulsadas y quienes dirán que fue la mejor cosa que les pudo ocurrir en sus vidas. Vea el video. Jim Johnson. Jim Johnson. Jim Johnson. Jim Johnson. Mr. Johnson, how are you? Good. Appreciate you. Spending the time to do about this this afternoon. Would you please state your name for the court? Uh, James R. Johnson. Okay. And how do you know Mr. Martinez? I have been uh, an acquaintance of uh, Mr. Martinez for a number of years. Uh, we're in a, in a circuit of congregations that uh, meet together uh, three times a year. Okay. And I've uh, dealt with him on those occasions. And are you a member of uh, the Jehovah's Witness faith? Yes. Okay. And what sort of uh, expertise, if any, do you have in that faith, in the, the, the doctrines of the faith? I have uh, 25 years of being a presiding overseer in the Salt Lake area. Okay. And have you, had the, have you ever been an elder? I am an elder. You're an elder currently, yes. in good standing? For... for uh, Since 1971. Okay, and you you're continuously in, you're continuously in good standing with the faith. Yes. Okay. Uh, what can you tell us about the the doctrine of disfellowshipping? Well, the, in reference to disfellowshipping, um, the focus there is it's a congregational matter. When when one is disfellowshipped, um, they are disfellowshipped from the standpoint of <laughs> Certain things have been uh, dealt with, uh, uh, conduct that uh, the, the individual has been involved with or whatever. And uh, so when one is disfellowshipped, uh, the term fellowship means you fellowship with people. Disfellowship means you don't fellowship. Okay. So it's a congregational matter. I would like to emphasize it's not a family matter. Now, how, what's the distinction there? Uh, from a congregational matter, an ecclesiastical uh, portion of this, uh, the uh, congregation would be involved with uh, disfellowshipping, uh, no longer fellowshipping with that individual. In a family matter situation, unlike other um, stereotypes of such things as uh, Amish and so forth, where shunning is involved, where the whole family is shunned or whatever, uh, we do not feel, families are families even after conduct, even after these things, families still remain the focus. So disfellowshipping is from a congregational standpoint, not a family. I, I really need to emphasize that. So would it be accurate to say that a member of the same family is not required to disfellowship another member of their family? Yeah, the, the way we look at that is, uh, let's say for example, a husband and wife. The wife gets uh, disfellowshipped. Okay. They're still married. They still get up in the morning. They still need to know where the Cheerios are. It's not like they throw them out into the street and say, you're shunned, you're no longer part of the family. Does the husband uh, still they, talk they, to the wife? They still talk. They still have marital due. Uh, the, the family arrangement, that's why I say it's not a family matter, it's a congregational matter. 
Now, when it comes to uh, having a spiritual fellowship, that's congregational, that's ecclesiastical. And that's where the Bible makes it very clear in uh, several occasions there that uh, that's the responsibility of congregation members to adhere to that. Okay. When, uh, let's take a hypothetical in a divorce situation. If the mother was disfellowshipped, would the children be required to shun the mother? No. No, they, uh, Would the children be shunned while, while they're with the mother? There's an important uh, point to keep in mind there. Are the children baptized members of the congregation? If they're not, then they're truly only family and nothing applies. They, it's their mother. It's the one that gave them life. Of course they would continue to have a relationship with that individual. Do you happen to have any knowledge as to whether or not the, the children of Mr. Martinez are baptized? I don't. Uh, okay. I, I'm from Salt Lake, so I don't know You're not a, in a lot about congregation. the part of the family. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, I, one other thing I'd like to emphasize on disfellowshipping is uh, when one gets uh, becomes one of Jehovah's Witnesses, the elders in the congregation will go through several hundred questions with an individual prior to their becoming baptized. And part of that process is to make sure they understand the disfellowshipping and the disassociation process. Okay. Uh, because that's a key important part of, of, of their Christian life. Well, what is the that. purpose of the disfellowshipping process? One, and let me finish that uh, oh. comment. Uh, in reference to, it's my understanding that uh, Leonard's ex-wife uh, was disassociated herself from the congregation. She was never dis disfellowshipped, if I have that accurate. Okay. Uh, disassociation means that she says, uh, voluntarily, on her own, she writes a letter and says, I do not want to be viewed as one of Jehovah's Witnesses any longer. Okay, so, so there's, was, there's the two categories. She, she voluntarily chose to leave rather than being expelled from the congregation. Just like she voluntarily chose to get baptized and become a member of Jehovah's Witnesses to begin with. Okay. She voluntarily said, I do not want to be part of that any longer. Okay. So there's the two terms, disassociation and disfellowship that, uh, that we use. We do not use the term shun. That's, shunning takes on a, a very uh, stereotype, in, including throwing family out, tarring, feathering, and all that. We, we treat that very similar. Most organizations that I know either have an excommunication process or a disfellowshipping process that, in reference to their people. Uh, here locally, we're familiar with Sonia Johnson, who was excommunicated from uh, uh, the local religion years ago. Uh, People have that, that's a common thing within our organizations. Do you know of any religion that allows someone to, uh, let's say, go against their teachings and still remain in good standing? I personally, now I'm not an expert on that. I, I certainly have a, a number of years of experience in talking to people, but uh, I, I Let's put it this way: Is it common practice in all religions to disfellowship? Uh, it, it, that I'm aware of, a lot of times they don't adhere to their standards as closely as perhaps Jehovah's Witnesses might, uh, or at least be uh, uh, talked about in, in that way. That's all I have. Ross. Thank you. Is there a magazine that uh, the organization publishes called the Awake Magazine? Yes. What's that? The Awake Magazine is a semi-monthly magazine that uh, has various articles in it, uh, more focused around world events. The Watchtower Magazine is its companion that uh, is more focused on Bible topics. Okay, so the Awake magazine comes from the New York headquarters, published by them, and That's then it's correct. disseminated. That's correct. As you go door to door, you leave copies of this? Yes. Would they have doctrine, for lack of a better term, I don't know what you would call it, but authoritative uh, doctrine concerning the organization? Would they have doctrine? Would they Contained in the Awake magazine? 
with the Awake magazine is published by Jehovah's Witnesses. So it would be doctrine. Or it would be something acceptable to yes. the six million members of yes. Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've been an overseer for 25 years? I've been an overseer for 30 years. 30 I've years. been the presiding overseer in Sugar House uh, area for 25 years. And I can certainly let you read this, and Mr. Jensen has a copy of it. It was attached to affidavit of Don D. Hines, and it's uh, some quotations from the Awake magazine that deal with the shunning issue. Uh, as I understand, you testified the Jehovah Witness organization does not shun, especially in the context of, say, the uh, people in Pennsylvania, the Amish. You what don't shun in that What fashion. I was saying is... Uh, that isn't what I said. What I said was, um, we do not use the term shunning okay. because of that stereotype. It includes families and, and everything. If you just look up the word shun in the dictionary, the Hatfields shunned the McCoys. Uh, if you don't fellowship with somebody, is that shunning? That's the question I guess I'm asking you. Obviously. To draw the distinction. Yeah. It, it, it is a difference, in your opinion? In a congregational matter, as I stated earlier, disfellowshipping applies to the congregation situation. And I don't think the term shunning is all that appropriate. It, it has a connotation that, and we Barry said, if you look through all our publications, you'll find very few times that the word's actually used. And generally, it's used in regard to conduct shun gambling or shun alcoholism or shun whatever. That's usually the context. Let me just, we're short on time here. I'm, I'm not if, sure if you're familiar with this, but in, uh, uh, where is it, First Corinthians, there's a quote that's talked about in this article. It says, Paul told the congregation, quit mixing in company with anyone called a brother. That is a fornicator or a greedy person or an idolater or a reveler or a drunker or an extortionist, not even eating with such a man. Yeah, you're quoting from chapter 5 of uh, 1 Corinthians. Right. Um, 11 just, through 13. Uh, uh, you, you didn't get it all. Uh, at the beginning it says it's talking about uh, fornication is reported among you. And it talks about this individual was had fornicated with his father's wife and then in verse 5 it says hand such a man over to Satan for destruction of the flesh in order that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord clear away the old leaven that you may be a new lump according to as you are free from ferment so yeah that's in the Bible so if you have an idolater or reveler or fornicator whichever term you want to use that person is disfellowshipped uh, what status do they have now as a disfellowship baptized member of the congregation? Being a congregational matter, they would no longer be a part of the congregation. Um, they How are they looked on? What's their status? No longer as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And that's it. They're not. Uh, the congregation isn't told to despise or hate or look upon that person as an evil person that had the truth and has now lost it and is a follower of the devil. The congregation, the, the title disfellowship means no fellowship. So the congregation is admonished not to fellowship with that individual. As Paul said here, it introduces the potential of leaven into the congregation. That person might convince you that fornicating is fine. Go ahead and do it. It's bad association. So that's what they're told. Okay, so don't associate with them at all. If you were out in the middle of the country and you drove by and they had a flat tire, uh, what would you do? Would you I would to, stop and help them. But what, so what would you do? Jehovah's would stop and help that person. What if they're... It's the main thing to do. They're, they're stuck in, the, in a storm. Their tire's flat. Put them in the car. Take them down. But you wouldn't talk about the latest article in the Wake magazine. and That's fellowship. That's, that's what we define as fellowship. Okay, again, my question, if you could give me a direct answer, is an individual has been, this fellowship, considered demonic? No, and, and uh, in every case is different. Uh, one individual might get this fellowship because they really 
were wicked, a wicked person. Another person may get this fellowship because they inadvertently fell into some practice and uh, at some point in time will repent of that. They're not wicked at all. What they did is bad and had to be dealt with, but the individual is, uh, is not a wicked individual and the mercy of God, they'll be allowed to repent and, and to make their way back. Okay, so and you're, based you're, on that, the elders meet with them and are instructed to meet with them uh, once a year to look for individuals like that that can uh, make their way back into a, a, repentant, a relationship with their Creator. So the one that's really wicked, they're demonic. Well, you asked me if, if all the fellowship ones are wicked. It depends on the situation. No, you, you gave me two examples and I'm referring to the one that is really wicked. Okay. Are they to be treated as a demonic individual and no association, no contact, no What do you no mean creed? by demonic? I, I'm asking you. I, I, I can't answer your question. I don't know what you mean by demonic. What does demonic mean to you? Uh, that, that's your, the devil. You're part of the devil. Okay. That's the description we'll use. Is a really wicked, disfellowshipped member considered demonic in your definition? Not always. Depends on this. Every circumstance has its own merit. Not always, but sometimes. I didn't know that he has. You know. Well, he was given an answer. Move along. If an individual, uh, being the expert, if an individual of your congregation were to celebrate Christmas, what kind of discipline would be taken against them, or a birthday? And are they different? If a person in the congregation was involved in, in activities like that, the elders would sit down with the individual and try to determine what's going on. The objective is, as Jesus said, if you have 100 sheep and one's lost, leave the 99 and go find the one. So the objective is to help that individual. Whether it's uh, worshiping uh, something like that or or Christmas, celebrating Christmas, or fornication, or whatever it happens to be. The elders will meet with that individual based on the person's um, attitude at that time will have a direct relevance to what they do. So if they celebrate Christmas, there will be some action taken. What, to what degree is the question? Depends on the, each situation is different. Uh, you're trying to get me to stereotype all of those, and they're all different. No, I, In my I'm, 25 years, every one of them are different. I don't want to argue with you. I'm just giving you a hypothetical. If you were to celebrate Christmas, there would be some action taken. The elders would meet with the individual to determine the situation. And there could be some discipline, because at times discipline is necessary. There could be. To cleanse the organization. No, to help the individual. Helping the individual is number one. Okay. That's all I have here. Oh, one more question. <coughs> is there a custody packet? Are you familiar with custody that? Custody packet? Yes, sir. I've never heard of a custody Never heard of packet. it? Uh, does the headquarters or the congregation, if they have local autonomy, uh, do, in, do they ever sit down and consult with children or parents if there's a custody dispute going on? Does, let me make sure I understand that. Does the local congregation sit down and discuss a, a strategy or a package or something? Yeah, let's say one of the elders, uh, there's members of the congregation, they're going through a custody battle and uh, they have some questions religiously and they go to their elder or maybe come to you as an overseer. Uh, do you have some direction from headquarters as to how to deal with them, how to answer them? Is there a custody packet published by headquarters in, in to assist my, you with that? In my 25 years of doing this, I have never seen a custody packet, never heard the term used until just now. I, as far as will the elders sit down, we'll sit down with any one of the members that's having a, whatever the problem is and we'll help them, we'll discuss with them, we'll look at ways that if they have questions, we'll deal with it. If it has a legal implication, we have access to uh, attorneys in Brooklyn that we can talk to. So if one of uh, your elders, at least as much as six months ago, 
were to have testified that he had a custody packet and used it, you're not familiar with that, never heard of it? I have never heard of a custody packet. I have no idea what he's talking about. I've been doing this a long time. Custody book, does that make any difference? Custody book, I've never heard of a custody book. Thank you. Nothing for you, Your Honor. Further questions? Mr. Johnson, is that appropriate? Are you Mr. Johnson or Elder Johnson? We do not have titles. Okay. What is a sin? And what do you consider to be a sin? Well, if you go to the Greek word that sin is taken from, it means missing the mark. That's what the Greek word means. Okay. So when it comes to God, he asks us to do certain things. If we miss the mark, we sin. Okay. Would it imply in a sin, would it imply that you have to know, you have to know better? Not really. Sometimes you hear the old saying, ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's not true with God. God is so loving and merciful that if you make a mistake and you were ignorant, he understands that. Okay. Would that person who makes a mistake ignorantly be held to the same level of accountability as someone who knows that what they're doing is wrong and decides to do it anyway? I realize you're short on time. I could take you to a scripture right now and just let the Bible answer that. The Bible has a fine answer for that. It says if you know and sin, you're doubly accountable. So there's a higher level of accountability. Absolutely. That's what the Bible says. If somebody's a member in good standing in the church, well, the organization, they know that the organization does not believe in celebrating Christmas and they decide to celebrate Christmas, would that be cause for concern to the elders? Absolutely. Because they're going against what they have been taught is their belief, right? Yes. Okay. The gentleman earlier said that if a Jehovah's Witness celebrated Christmas, they would be automatically disfellowshipped. Is that true or not true? That's totally false. Totally. Unequivocally. What would happen to a person who just decided, I'm going to get a Christmas tree and celebrate Christmas, and what will... Mr. Jensen, you're going to make that question hypothetical. You're going to have to mean an elder of the church. Let's say an elder. An elder of the church? Yes. Would that be cause for concern? The other elders would talk to that individual immediately, check out. If all of a sudden one of the elders took up visiting Las Vegas and some of the brothels down there, same thing. That would be cause for concern. That would be cause for concern. Is it automatic disfellowship? No. The elders would talk to that man? The elders would talk to the individual. It's not the act that is the issue. It's the person's attitude toward the act. Okay. Maybe their level of knowledge, their intent. Is that covered in attitude? Absolutely. Okay. Now, one more thing I'd like to emphasize is for every six or ten people you bring in here that have had bad experiences, I can bring a hundred people that have been disfellowshipped that will sit up on this stand and tell you it's the best thing that ever happened to them in their life. Because they were disciplined and they seen what they were doing wrong. They were helped to understand it and they moved forward with their life. Is the disfellowshipping process part of the repentance process? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 7 says that God disciplines those he loves. So we feel that as a secondary, the first thing of disfellowshipping is a protection of the congregation, as I stated earlier. The secondary thing is discipline to the individual. And it sometimes shocks them into understanding, hey, you know, that conduct wasn't right and I'm going to do it. If I want to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses and enjoy a relationship with my creator, here's what I'm going to do to adhere to that. And they will change what they're doing and 
and uh, then be reinstated in the current. Thousands are reinstated every year, just exactly like what you just said. Okay. Uh, can a person be disfellowshipped who has not been baptized? No. No. So if I were to tell you that uh, a seven-year-old girl was invited to a Christmas party who had not been baptized, her father would certainly have, he's the head of the family, he would have, he'd have to be talked to on why her, his family's engaging in conduct like that. Okay. But she, she's not one of Jehovah's Witnesses until she's baptized. She would not be dealt with uh, from a disfellowshipping standpoint. Okay, would she be, uh, let me use the word shunned, even though we know that the organization does not use that she word. She would be helped. She would be loved and helped. Thank you. All right. Can I ask a couple of follow-up questions, Shana? Mm -hmm. I'll be real brief. I need to approach the witness if I could. I only have one okay. copy. These are some quotes or citations. I guess you can follow up if you want to. Uh, in the Watchtower magazine, you said that was one of two magazines that come from the headquarters. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you read this first statement? 1952. Uh -huh. Watchtower. Let me ask you about that. Has the doctrine of the organization changed in the last 40, 50 years? Well, you keep using the term doctrine. Doctrine is a. Uh, a term that's used for things like Trinity and things like that. This type of stuff is behavior, it's uh, personal uh, conscience is involved. Uh, doc doctrine is uh, a word that, uh, in my mind, that it is not covered by what you're talking about here. It's How you treat this fellowship person has changed over the years? A lot of things have changed over the years, haven't we? Is that a yes or no? Yes. Uh, wait, wait a minute. The way we treat disfellowship people has changed over the years? That's the question. Yeah. Let me read this, though, and see what you're driving at. Because yeah. this is one little <laughs> sentence that could be way out of context. Who knows where it came from? The Watchtower publication of Jones would state how they are to treat... Did this come off of the apostate website? Do you know? Did it? No, it's just cut and paste out of the Watchtower volume. But I mean the part that says the Watchtower publications. Just read it and see if you can answer it. If you can't tell us, let's move along. Well, I was just involved in some Olympic things down in Salt Lake for where I work at OC Tanner. And I was uh, involved in a situation where a bunch of Baptists were at one of the meetings. And this is not responsive. Yes, 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 let's go ahead okay. and see what. We must hate in the truest sense, which is to regard with extreme and active aversion, to consider as loathsome, odious, filthy, to detest. I have a quote from a recent Watchtower that does so, show the latest thought. No, I don't want that. Is this accurate as far as you know? In 52 it was. It was it's, in 52. it's changed now. So that policy, whatever you want to call it, has changed. Yep. Okay. But that was accurate back then. In 52 it was, no? 50 years ago? Uh, 1981, read that one there. Okay. Would upholding God's righteousness and his disfellowshipping arrangement mean that Christians should not speak at all with an expelled person, not even saying hello? A simple hello to someone can be the first step that develops into a con conversation. Okay, uh, it has dot, dot, dot after that. Uh, if you was to read the rest of it, this is accurate. The 81 is one of our magazines referred to. In fact, I have a copy of the whole paragraph here. And uh, what, it's, what it's saying is a hello may start you into fellowshipping. May open the door. Yeah, so, so be aware of that. Don't say hello. Doesn't say that, does it? Now that's what I'm asking you. No, it doesn't say that. It says a hello may start fellowshipping. Be careful. So say hello? Does it? It doesn't say not to. Well, what does it mean? The simple hello opens the door. So what, what does so that mean? So be careful. Do not associate. Do not fellowship. This fellowship means don't fellowship. Okay. You ran into somebody at the store. And you come around the aisle. And there they are. And they run right into you. And they say hi. You say hi. It's a humane thing to do. Is there a Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses organizational manual? 
Jehovah's Witnesses organizational man. Never heard of one. This is obviously apostate. Uh, well, let me correct you. You said these were all accurate quotes. Is that right? No, I didn't. Oh, you didn't? That first quote you said was accurate, In but 52. it's over. 52. Okay. You said the second one was accurate. It's accurate, but it's taken out of context. Okay, so it's not apostate. They're from your magazines. No. The congregations. Well, well counsel, I think we're just getting into arguments. That's all I have here. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, you may step down. You're not discuss the testimony with anyone other than the attorneys until after this hearing. Can this witness be excused? No objection. Mr. Jensen, do you want the witness to be excused? Yes, he can be excused. Thank you. Call Leonard Martinez. Please tell Ms. Ward that the testimony about to present in this hearing now before the court will be the truth of the